He is currently a DAAD lecturer at Universitas Indonesia in Depok. So without further ado, Dr. Wargamut, the time is yours. Yeah, thank you. So um, <clears throat> what I'm going to present today is actually an updated version of uh, something I published 10 years ago and something I have been working on for the past 14, 15, 16 years. Um, I started working in this topic uh, of typological rarity because first of all, I was interested in endangered languages. And whenever you read some introduction, some, some general publication about endangered languages, what they always say is, yeah, we don't know what features may, may be hidden in some undocumented language some exotic uh, unknown features. Uh, so it's important that we document uh, these endangered languages. And I was uh, interested in what, what would they mean in, in this, uh, that there are unusual features or rare features uh, in, in those languages. And that's how I started working on the typological rarity of endangered languages. Uh, and it's, that led me to exactly this uh, topic I'm going to talk about now. <clears throat> so, um, as I said, uh, there are there are claims that, uh, or there is a statement that some languages show many cross linguistically rare or typological unusual features. Um, there has been a collection, an online collection made by Franz Planck. Uh, beginning in the year 2000 and more or less abandoned in, I think, 2014, 2013, um, <clears throat> where they basically collected information on the opposite of language universals. That is, they were looking for things that are, uh, give, not, are given in almost all languages, but not in a few, or that were given only in very few languages. Um, so as to have a documentation on whether linguistic universals really are universals. Um, from that, you come to uh, the, <clears throat> you come to the notion of linguistic rarity or unusualness or however you want to call it. Um, there is a lot of term terminology involved here that is judgmental or lacking neutrality. So I'm going to use the word rare and not unusual or exotic or whatever. So <clears throat> it then has been suggested that extra linguistic factors like speaker community size or community isolation play a role in the raise and maintenance of, in the rise and maintenance of such cross linguistically rare features. Um, and what I'm going to do here is present a way to quantify rareness, rarity, and to evaluate uh, how the presence or absence of rare features may correlate with speaker community size. Um, <clears throat> so in order to do that, we first have to look at what is typological rarity. And um, I've been told not to assume that everybody in the audience already knows uh, what that is. So I'm going to introduce typological rarity. Um, <clears throat> basically, what we mean with that is that we have anything that is in the, in the makeup of a language that is not found in most other languages of the world. In this little thought bubble of our friend Sherlock here, we see, for example, things that were assumed not to occur in any language at all, or only in one or two languages of the world's 7,000 languages. So <clears throat> how can we quantify this? Um, that's exactly where my time in Leipzig uh, comes into play, because in Leipzig uh, they published the World Atlas of Language Structures, which I will call Walls from now on. Um, and someone has a lot of background noise there. Um, so. Uh, in Leipzig, they published the World Atlas of Language Structures in 2005. And this, first of all, was a book publication. Uh, it contains 142 maps or chapters. 
uh, and each of these maps features between 35 and roughly 1,300 languages. Um, they tried to have at least 120 sam uh, languages in the so-called core sample, which is these 120 should occur on all maps. Of course, not on the three maps on, on sign languages and on the maps on writing systems. Uh, anyway, in all in all, the walls features about 2,560 languages. And for these languages, they are coding for features and feature values, which together I call characteristics. So feature is something like basic word order in a, in a, in a sentence. Yeah, that is the feature. And the feature value could be something like SOB, subject, object, verb, or SEO, subject, verb, object, and so on. So for any given feature, you have at least two different values. Otherwise, the distinction would be pointless. Um, for some features, you only have binary distinctions. For some features, you have 13, 14, 15 different values. And these combinations of features and feature values uh, will be called characteristics here. Um, <clears throat> this walls is based uh, on a database, and this database has been converted into an online uh, database and an online uh, site where people can use the World Atlas of Language Structures and add correct information. You see the URL uh, on the slide. Um, and just to give you a brief, uh, small uh, impression how this looks like, this is one example map. Um, the picture is taken from the, from the press release back then when the book was published. Um, so it's not exactly the map like it is in the book almost. And you see here a map of 1,105 languages um, with the feature order of genitive and noun. And the feature values are genitive noun now genitive and no dominant order. And you see that there is a distribution like there's 600 languages having genitive noun, 400 languages having non genitive and only 82 languages having no dominant order. So that already shows us that uh, linguistically typological features are not necessarily distributed evenly over the languages of the world. Yeah, we have one or two features that are quite common, and we have fe feature values uh, or characteristics that are not so common. <clears throat> and that's where we come to typological rarity. There are a lot of terms here that have been floating around in the internet and in publications since about 2000. And I'm going to talk here about uh, rara, rarissima, unicalia, only to introduce the terms, and I use rara as the cover term for all of them. Um, so basically this all means that these are typologically rare features, uh, and we can have different kinds of rarity. Positive versus negative rarity, that means, uh, positive rarity means the fact that one language has a characteristic, as opposed to not having it, is rare. That is, a language having the grapheme like German SZ, or a language having um, a sound like the, like the Czech R, R, uh, having this is rare, so this is a positive vowel. Uh, on the other hand, we can have things like negative rarity, that means a language not having a certain characteristic is rare. Uh, standard example for this is the notorious language Piraha uh, for not having, for example, a singular plural distinction in pronouns uh, or not having numerals. And that is negative rarity. You have you, your language does not have something, and that fact is, make, is rare. And we have absolute versus relative rarity, that is, something can be absolutely rare across all the languages of the world. Um, across all languages of one sample, uh, as opposed to relative rarity, that is a feature or its absence uh, may be rare in one area as opposed to the rest of the world, or it may be present in one area and rare in the rest of the world. Uh, so this is absolute versus relative rarity, and this mostly goes with areas and sometimes with, uh, with uh, 
<coughs> language families or language genera. So <coughs> our working definition, which I basically stole from, uh, from work by Daniela Freirich, is that rare should mean it's found in less than 5% of the languages. For, for the World Atlas of Language Structures, that means in less than 128 of the 2,650 languages. For the languages of the world, it means uh, it found uh, a characteristic is found in less than 350 of the world's 7,000 languages. So, um, how does it look like? We have, <clears throat> we're having something like a typ typological features and they are distributed. So the, the box you see here is the realm of possible human languages and the dots you see are characteristics, that is features plus feature values. And you see that there's a distribution, uh, there's white, gray, and black dots, that is different feature values. And they're all basically similar with a few outliers. So this is the actual distribution of typological features Basically, this image goes back to Matthew Dreyer's work, uh, but it has been modified, as you can see. So, um, when we have rare features that are basically only found in very few languages, we call them rara, yeah, and they are found in only few languages of the world. We have relative rara that you can see here, like for example, with the different colors, you have some feature value that is not, not rare in the red family, yeah, the red languages on the left of, this, of the box. Yeah, all these red languages may be belonging to the same family or maybe belonging to some kind of Sprachbund or some kind of area. And in these languages, a feature um, a characteristic is present, but in all the other languages of the world, it's not present. So that would be a relative uh, what we just talked about. And absolute rara are those that are rare on an absolute scale that is even within their family, within their area, it is rare. And Rissima, which is something we are not going to delve into here too much, are characterized as being found in only less than 1% of the languages of one sample of the world's languages. Um, and then we have Unicalia or Singularia, which are found only in one language. Yeah, there are things like that. Uh, like, for example, the, the Czech sound, uh, that's the R of this Hachek accent. Uh, <coughs> uh, alveolar trill fricative. Uh, that thing is found only in the Czech language. So this is a singular or unical. <coughs> so how can we quantify all this? Uh, this is where work from my friend and colleague, Michael Sisso, comes into play. Um, he did something like rarity index calculation. Um, and he based that on the uh, WALS database. Um, basically, he used all the languages that can be compared like this uh, mathematically. So he had to take out the, uh, the, language, the sign languages and he had to take out the map on writing systems because these are not connected to single languages and these are not uh, showing features that are comparable to the features um, given for all the other languages in the world. So CISAL's sample is a little smaller, it's 2489 instead of 2060, but in the end it's almost the same. And he used these to calculate in the so-called rarity index uh, that is, in his own words, to, cal to compute the chance of occurrence for all characteristic characteristics of a particular language and then take the mean over all these chance of occurrence. That is, he you did not only use the WALS database, he also created for every feature, uh, for every characteristic, for every feature, he uh, created 1,000 languages with random characteristics and could then see, okay, if there's a chance distribution, it is this, and if this is different from the distribution within uh, walls or within the actual languages, then there is something that is uh, sticking out as unusual or as a, as a skewed distribution. That, that is what is interesting is here. <clears throat> so a high mean rarity index value is 
ambiguous. That is, we can have one language with one very extremely rare or unique feature or characteristic, or we can have a language which has, which has a lot of slightly rare characteristics. And just calculating this, this rarity index, we don't know. It just says, oh yeah, this language has a rarity index of whatever, 3.5, which would tell us, oh yeah, this language is kind of uh, particular uh, and is different from the average human language. But we don't know whether that's due to one extremely rare feature or whether it's due to a lot of features. So Michael calculated what is called rarity index level, as I said, with these 1,000 simulated languages. And then he has a value to say, okay, high rarity index level indicates that the index value itself is robust. He, he uses the word robust, not significant, because it's not a significance test, but it's only coming close to it. And then he calculated this for single languages and for aerial groups of languages to get absolute relative rarity. <clears throat> and the result of this calculation is this. Yeah, this is from, from Michael Cisco's work. It's the top 15 languages according to their mean rarity index level. Uh, and you see there is several there's, uh, languages from, from all over the world found in there. I don't know what this yellow window is doing here. It seems like cannot, it cannot. whenever you switch to another slide. Oh dear. Yeah. But I don't know why. Uh, that's okay. We can try to ignore it. Okay. Yeah, it it fades away after a few seconds. So okay. Okay, let's let's go back. So so this is typological rarity, and now we have to see how we can map that on to community surface. <clears throat> and that actually takes us to this community size. My community size data is based on work I did back then, when in the good old days when ethnolog was still freely available. Um, and we got the data from the 15th edition and could uh, could uh, da could download and, and compute compute uh, the num speaker numbers from Ethnolog. There was a category called nearly extinct languages. That is languages which all have less than 1,000. Most of them less than 100 speakers. And we cross referenced that. Uh, in painstaking work from CISO's adapted walls database to this to this data because uh, the walls uh, database use their own so-called walls codes, three letter codes, which are not the same like the ISO codes that Ethanol and uh, Wikipedia and Google uh, are using. So we had to map these. Uh, we had to map these for every single language, which took me a couple of weeks actually. Uh, so in the end, we found uh, languages that are on the one hand endangered and on the other hand are featured in the world atlas of language structures. And those turned out to be 152 of the languages from, from, from the ethnolog list, uh, which are also featured in walls. And so we call, I call this the sample of small languages. And as a control group, I took the 152 biggest languages from walls, that is uh, from the 500 something languages of having more than 2 million speakers, uh, I took those 152 that also are featured in the world of language structures. And now we're coming back to the same list you saw earlier, the list I quoted from Michael Sisa, but now I added the speaker numbers. And when you look at the speaker numbers, yeah, uh, the rarest or most unusual language in the list has five speakers only. Yeah. Okay, the next one has 320,000 speakers. This is a diff uh, little different uh, ballpark uh, number here, or newer with, with uh, 800,000 speakers. But all in all, you see that the, most of the languages in the top 15 are actually rather small. Uh, they have less than 1,000 speakers, and some have one or two speakers. Yeah. Uh, Varva is has gone extinct uh, in the meantime. Uh, Ayak has gone extinct in the meantime. So those numbers in the brackets are numbers that were 
currently 2005, but not uh, currently anymore. Um, and if we map these rarity indexes plus uh, endangerment, uh, we get a map that looks a little bit like this. We see that the dark, the darker uh, um, the symbol is, the, um, the high, higher is the rarity index, the brighter or lighter uh, the symbol is, the less unusual features are found in these languages. And then you see with, uh, with the speaker numbers, you see a lot of triangles with languages having less than 10 speakers, squares having less than 100 speakers, or some of the dots, the languages have mixed less than 300 speakers. So what we see here is that even across the so-called small languages, we have some kind of distribution. Not all of them have rare features, not all of them are typologically very unusual. <clears throat> um, but if we look at it uh, less impressionistically from the map, but really use uh, the entire distribution, we find that over the, the entire sample of, of uh, walls languages, we have a distribution which goes a little bit towards the normal or usual end uh, is we have a lot of average languages and we have some uh, less average languages sticking out at the other end of the rarity index level. So the higher on the rarity index level in percentage, the more uh, exotic or the more rare features are found in a given language. And this is the general distribution over the entire world atlas of language searches. And this is the distribution only over the small languages. And you see a, a difference immediately. Um, <clears throat> you see the difference immediately. There is this clear distribution towards the higher end of the rarity index level. That is, we having very few languages on the zero to, to 40 uh, percent range. And we have most, uh, most languages or many languages on the 80 to 100 percent. Uh, if we compare this now to the big languages, we see that this is a diff completely different picture. <clears throat> Taking this uh, on to... Um, so we, we see here that the um, bigger languages are more, a little more uh, behaving like the, like the walls languages in general, like these. Oops, that's too far, sorry. Uh, a little more like the walls languages in general, but still have their own little skewed distribution. In numbers, it looks like this. Uh, the entire um, adapted walls sample from CISO is 2,489 languages. We have 152 small, 152 big languages. And we see that um, <clears throat> the actual distributions are, for, for the small languages, are visibly shifted towards the, the higher end of the scale, uh, the first quartile for, for, the, for, also for, for the world atlas of language structures in general, the distribution should by design be that the first quartile is exactly at 25, the median should exactly be at uh, 50, the third quartile should and is actually exactly at 75 and the maximum is 100 and that's by design. Um, the fact, the, the question why this is a little skewed towards the lower end is something that uh, Michael Cisau pointed out in his publication that he said uh, he doesn't have an explanation for it yet. Um, but what we do see is that the small languages really stick out. They are quite far from 25, 50% actually with their first and second quartile. So uh, the mean is also visibly shifted upwards to 61. Um, so this is really a um, different picture for those small languages. <clears throat> uh, this is how it looks like in the box plots. Yeah, you can see that the small languages are quite far up on the mean rarity level, uh, mean rarity index level. That is, you find a lot of rare features in small languages in general. <clears throat> So to see whether this is in any form significant, uh, Michael did a t-test and 
the result was yes, compared to the walls overall sample, the, the distribution of the small languages is indeed a highly, very highly significant. Uh, so the difference is something that is a statistical signal. Uh, for the comparison between walls and big language, there's no significant uh, difference. And for the difference between small and big languages, the significance was more moderate, so we're not going to take that into consideration. Um, in the end, what I wrote uh, in 2010 is, this result proves that the observable difference is truly a significant. One cannot avoid the conclusion that the small languages of our sample actually do have more cross-linguistically rare features, or in other words, that there is a significantly higher likelihood to find small or endangered languages in the upper end of the rarity scale. Sounds nice, and this could be the end. Uh, and I just say, oh yeah, that's it. Uh, but and now there comes the big but, because if we look at the top 100 uh, languages of the rarity index, there are some languages which we can by no means whatsoever call small languages. Uh, we see the top, some of the top 20 languages uh, made it into the top uh, 100 rarity index languages. Uh, Mandarin, Chinese, German, or Standard High German, and Cantonese. Uh, and those count by the tens to hundreds of millions of students almost one million speakers for Mandarin. So those are by so those are not really small but rather extremely big languages. And this fact needs to needs to be explained. If we want to generalize that rare features are found in small languages, then why do they also occur significantly and, and with a robust index level like 98% uh, in huge languages like these? Um, and English just barely did not make the cut for the, for the top 100 of the rarity index, but Frisian is in there. Dutch is also close to the top 100. So why are rather big languages uh, in the top of the rarity index of, of 2,500 2, languages when we say that rare features are found in small languages? So, um, if we just look at the languages from the top five rarity index level, we see uh, this kind of distribution. Uh, this is the absolute rarity calculated. Uh, that is only individual languages with a very high top five uh, rarity index level. Yeah, and we see, for example, we see German and Frisian marked there. We also uh, see some some uh, clusters already we see that there's a cluster in the caucasus we see that there's a cluster in southern china we see the cluster in new guinea uh, and these all uh, turn out to be even more interesting when we look at the relative reality. that is we see that in some areas we do have a cluster of, of rare languages uh, as opposed to the, to the rest of the world so <clears throat> The question is, can we also find, when we, if we find big languages at the top end of the rarity index, do we also find small languages at the bottom of the, uh, of the rarity index? That is, languages which do not have rare or uh, cross-linguistically rare features at all. And as a matter of fact, we do. So this is uh, the opposite end of the list. I cannot show you all 2,400. That would be quite a huge slide and would take weeks to comment. So I just show you the bottom 15. And if you look at the speaker numbers, OK, we have one language with uh, 2 million speakers, another with almost 2 million speakers, but we also have some small languages. Um, one of them the, needs a little explanation. The number from Cornish is in brackets because actually it has been extinct or considered extinct and been revitalized. So whether you want to count that speaker number or not is probably up to your own taste and interpretation. Uh, but you see that also in the top, in the bottom uh, 15, there are some endangered languages, like for example, Maun, with 200 speakers only. So. Um, we have to say that uh, we find small languages at both ends, actually. So 
in general, we can say small language sample has a higher occurrence of lava. So there is a higher likelihood of lava in small languages. But lava are also found in big languages. So we cannot just generalize that rara are only found in small languages. And we have some un unusual small languages, languages that lack any rare features. Um, <clears throat> um, so not all small languages necessarily contain a lot. We cannot just generalize that community size is the one reason why languages evolve or maintain cross-linguistically rare features. So the question is how and where and why and who and so on. Uh, how does it happen? So how exactly do community size and typological rarity relate? Well, actually, we have three possibilities how these things can relate. There can be a correlation, be it a weak or indirect one or a strong one. And then we need to ask in which direction. That is, does community size influence the typological profile or does the pro typological profile influence community size, um, or it could be co-variation, that is both community size and typological rarity de both depend on a third factor, and then the question would of course be which? Um, and one very unpleasant idea is that this is entirely an artifact uh, result of chance, something artifact historical coincidence, uh, so that in the end uh, we don't really have something to talk about, but it's just result of chance development. That's just how the languages of the world are right now. Um, this, of, this would, of course, be quite uh, unpleasant because basically that means that we don't have anything we can generalize. And typologists, typologists always want to generalize and make predictions. And if it's just chance or something, other things we can do. So let's let's get over with this unpleasant uh, chance idea for, for uh, quickly. Of course, um, sampling or data availability may play a role. Um, only one of the endangered languages of Africa, for example, uh, as they are listed in, in, in the ethnologue, is also featured in WALS. That's Principance. Uh, that's the language you found uh, just off the coast of uh, Africa. Uh, there's a little triangle you see. Uh, that's this language. So all the other languages in WALS are either too small for the big language sample, about uh, more than two million speakers, or they are too big for the small language sample of less than 1,000 speakers. So that's, uh, that's how the world's data is based, because the world atlas of language structures basically can, could, they could only take uh, published data that was available in 2005, that is only, they could only take those grammatical features, those information from languages uh, where they have publications. And that leads us to the second uh, thing that may be playing a role in coincidence of sampling. Um, scholarly papers on small languages tend to discuss and emphasize cross linguistic peculiarities for various reasons. Uh, one of them is that no typologist uh, would ever write or get published a paper like, oh, another language just like English. Yeah, what they want to publish or what, what people want to see is languages that work differently. That's what's interesting for typologists. Rather, yeah, we're, uh, we want to see languages that work different from what we already know to see how far does the variety of possible human languages go. Yeah. So actually this, this, uh, this entire uh, set might be a little skewed because the papers available would emphasize those features or those characteristics that are typologically outliers. <clears throat> and then that also means that probably some languages in some of the larger maps uh, are only included because of their unusual features or unusual characteristics, while other more ordinary languages did not make it into the raw sample. Yeah, so, for example, if you have uh, a map or a chapter on phoneme inventories, of course, there would be a lot of languages with rare phonemes, with uh, big phoneme inventories of more than 100 phonemes or more. Of course, those languages would be included with these feature values, 
of the fact that, for example, they have uh, the very average uh, basic word order or something, will might perhaps not be coded in Moss. So that makes languages sometimes appear you know, more rare or more unusual than they actually are. But as a, as a matter of fact, this is controlled for by the rarity index, rarity index level calculations, because we have this compu computation over um, these simulated languages. So let's, get, let's do away with coincidence and think whether there are other factors that might be. So when, as I said in the beginning, I started working on endangered languages first and then got got all these papers and books uh, mentioning, oh yeah, um, endangered languages contain uh, rare, unusual linguistic features. That's why we need to protect and uh, document them and so on. So what we, what we can probably safely assume is that being endangered does not by and in itself cause a language to develop uh, uh, or an endangered language will not just suddenly develop some unusual characteristic, it will not develop otherwise. Conversely, it might rather lead to the loss of, of uh, rare features due to assimilative pressure. That is um, <clears throat> something I, I wrote on in, in 2005 too, uh, that sometimes not the entire language is endangered, but maybe one subsystem is endangered. Um, so actually, typologically unusual characteristics themselves can be endangered, even in otherwise vital languages. A good example for this is numeral systems, or naming systems, or writing systems. Yeah, just imagine, or just think of uh, writing systems that get the, are getting uh, are being abandoned. Uh, because of global assimilative pressure, yeah? like all those uh, native writing systems, all these old writing systems in Indonesia, yeah? you have uh, Aksara Java, you have Aksara Bali, you have uh, uh, all these different writing systems of Sulawesi and Sumatra. Um, yeah? And these are falling out of use, they are being endangered, yeah? because in everyday use, people would use the Latin language. So, the languages themselves may not be endangered, but they're rare features. Yeah? Same with naming systems, naming conventions, and the same with neural systems. Look at a language like Thai. Yeah? Thai itself is not an endangered language, but the old traditional numeral system has been replaced by the Chinese numeral system. The same happened to, with other languages too, Japanese. Uh, Japanese, you still use Japanese numbers for some things, but you use the Chinese system or other things, so that the traditional numeral systems can be endangered. So we cannot say that uh, Raha uh, get a rise in endangered languages. If at all, there would only be a negative correlation. Yeah? That is, we could expect that in endangered languages we find less rare features, at least at one stage of endangerment. <coughs> so, could it be the other way around? Could it be that rare characteristics uh, cause uh, endangerment? Not so much. That is, rare characteristics can themselves be endangered. That's what I just said. Um, and this may be the first uh, diagnostic sign, the first step in the language shift, shift uh, scenario. Yeah, um, this is shown, for example, in, in Annette Schmidt's book, um, Young People's Dear from, from 1982, where she shows that actually some typologically rare characteristics, characteristics um, are the ones falling out of use first under the pressure of assimilation to English. But that means that actually the assimilative pressure is the factor leading to endangerment, not the rare characteristics. So we have to say that if we have a correlation here between Raha and endangerment, that could only be mediated by, by social cultural factors like assimilative pressure. Yeah, and not by the fact that something is technologically rare. <coughs> Um, there is one aspect, one other aspect, um, 
one other extra linguistic factor that is being mentioned uh, or has been mentioned back then uh, regularly, and that is so-called enclave situation. And it has been shown that the trend to normalization or assimilation under contact with other normally larger languages of a less rare typological profile can only be avoided in so-called enclave situations where languages may remain more or less unaffected by majority language influence that affects globalization. Uh, Bickel and Bickel and Nichols are talking about the Himalayas there and languages like yeah, Mumshaski and, and other isolates, maybe also um, to a certain extent language like Basque. Uh, but you also have enclave situations other in, in other places where the pressure, the assimilative pressure from globalization and so on is not so strong, so that these languages can remain unaffected by this kind of influence. <clears throat> um, Anderson put it like this, there is a connection between the limited social spatial function of a dialect its relative closeness and its ability to sustain exorbitant phonetic developments. And so Anderson was writing about uh, size and, and complexity of uh, phoneme systems, uh, which he says that these uh, get more exorbitant, and more uh, complex in smaller communities that are remote from global mainstream language assimilation. So uh, an enclave situation could explain the rise and maintenance of Ra, but only in such enclaves and not in the true picture. So this cannot be all that there is. Um, so we have to look at other correlations and that brings us back to community size once again. And the question is, whether Raha can, or the fact that language has a typologically rare profile, can have an impact on community size. The question is, how would that be possible? Like, how would having cross linguistically unusual features impact the language's community size? And I'm sorry, but all the scenarios I can think of would involve other social cultural factors, again, like discrimination um, or certain exogamy patterns or whatever. Uh, or at language attitudes, that is, the attitudes of speakers to a language. This is something that, for example, happens uh, to, to some speakers of, of very small minority languages that have a different typological profile. Uh, their language is considered too primitive, too complex, too weird, uh, too, too, impractical, too impractical for everyday use and whatsoever. So uh, this has an impact on the attitude that people have towards their native language and that may lead them to, to shift away either from, from using certain constructions, so certain grammatical features, or shift away from using, using their language at all. But then we're going back to language endangerment. So um, the direct correlation here is something we cannot really see. <clears throat> I cannot really see how that would work. <clears throat> so we have to put it on its head and see whether that works. Can community size have an impact on the rare typological features? And actually, if we browse the literature, there are several uh, sources which report this kind of um, thing happening. Um, one of the first, uh, one of my first contacts with this question is a book on linguistic diversity by, by Daniel Nettle. Uh, who uses uh, mathematical simulations a lot uh, to show how the dynamics of language contact may have an impact on the typological makeup of the language. And he says basically that languages of small communities can allow for the spread of non-advantageous features, as he calls them. Um, here's the quote. If a group consists of just a few hundred people, the idiosyncrasies of one influential individual can spread through it through it very easily. This is not the case if the group consists of thousands or tens of thousands. In general, the smaller the community, the greater the probability that a given variant that has no functional advantage at all but is neutral or slightly, slightly disadvantages can replace the existing item and become the norm. This piece basically means 
this is basically exactly that. It shows that um, <clears throat> in small communities, uh, any kind of unusual feature, yeah, whether it's advantages or not, or whether it's more complex or not, is, is not the is not the point here. But any typologically unusual feature or feature that did not exist before can rise and establish itself much more easily in a small community. Yeah, um, there is this paper by by Kulik uh, in '92 who. Um, uh, reports of communities in Papua New Guinea where speakers deliberately decide to change their grammar just to be different so that their dialect, so that their language is distinct from the uh, neighboring groups. Yeah, And this leads to a lot of idiosyncrasies. There is uh, a speaker community actually conspiring to, um, to have something that their neighboring language does not have. Yeah? And say, okay, let's do it like this. Yeah, this is something that only can work in a small speaker community where people know one another, where this information can spread, and where where maybe even one person has enough authority to tell everybody, yeah, we're going to do it like this from now. Yeah, this is much more difficult in, in bigger speech communities where where uh, people do not, where not everybody will follow along these lines. <clears throat> Yeah, that's this, uh, the quote from, from Kulik. Um, <clears throat> so, um, on the other, uh, furthermore, we find in, in, in another paper that languages of small communities have a tendency to be more complex grammatically. Um, whatever more complex means, the problem is that the, the authors of this paper, uh, Reali, Chater, and Christiansen, uh, they use something like complexity and ease of acquisition. That is, uh, why do some small languages have grammatical complexity that is different or that is uh, difficult to acquire for, for, for L1 and L2 uh, acquisition? Um, <clears throat> so basically what, they, what they're dealing with here is complexity, but in general, linguistic rarity does not mean, necessarily mean it's more complex. It's just different from the average of the world's languages. Yeah? Uh, and of course, the paper has this problem that is very Eurocentric. What, is, what, cons uh, what uh, constitutes a simple language? What con constitutes grammatical simplicity? Uh, is it simpler to have uh, only only uh, two tenses, two verbal tenses, is it simpler to have lexical expressions for it? So they don't really quantify some uh, complexity in, in, a, in a satisfying way that is not kind of Eurocentric. But no, nevertheless, they do a lot of statistics and they say that languages with many speakers tend to be structurally simple, while small communities sometimes develop languages with great structural complexity. Uh, and then they say that paradoxically it's the inverse with the uh, lexicon, uh, with the lexicon size. Um, and it seems that this inverse pattern can depend on a single factor, ease of diffusion through the population. And it's basically trivial to say that, of course, uh, anything can diffuse faster through a small population than it can diffuse through a big population. So uh, in the end, this helps. Uh, this goes in the same vein as what, as what we've seen with Mental and Kulik before. Population size is a factor here. Um, another paper um, by Wichmann and Holman, and, and Wichmann did some other publications on this too. Um, he said that they say that there's no direct correlation for community size and rates of language change but the degree of connectivity is a factor. That is, um, as they say, um, the most plausible model for the greater part of human history is one in which changes propagate at a local level in a type of network where the individuals have different degrees of connectivity. So, what this means is uh, that the individuals know one another. Yeah, 
they are in close contact with one another. And that is something that we do find a lot in small communities. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, to put it like that, languages of small communities are more conservative. Languages, uh, larger languages tend to normalize. This is from from Trudeau, uh, quoting Milroy Milroy. Uh, so, language, linguistic change is slow to the extent that the relevant populations are well established and bound by strong ties, whereas it's rapid, rapid to the extent that weak ties exist in populations. Dense networks are most likely to be found in small, stable communities with few external contacts and a high degree of social cohesion. That means that um, languages, small languages, will have, which usually do have tightly knit communities do, on the one hand, uh, they are more conservative, that is, they preserve uh, their own profile much longer. Um, but on the other hand, they also allow for the, for the spread of, of uh, rare features. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, big languages tend to normalize. That means that if you have a big language with millions of speakers, there will probably be dialects, so there will be varieties, and there will be some kind of um, development that you see that these different varieties um, are assimilated into one uh, normalized, standardized version. Yeah, so that we have something like standard high German, we have something like Bahasa Indonesia, as opposed to local varieties of Malay, local varieties of German. So that's what they mean here. Uh, this is the normal thing that happens to bigger languages. Yeah, they have varieties, and these varieties kind of try to find some common ground, some normal. Yeah, uh, and so technologically rare things that you would find in the local varieties of the dialects will not end up in the bigger standard language. And we have this, for example, with with the uh, with, uh, interesting thing is, um, for example, German. Uh, does not have a distinction like kami kita, the first person plural, inclusive, exclusive distinction. German doesn't do that. Standard high German doesn't do that. There are some dialects in the south uh, of, of the German language area where you do have or did have a distinction like that, but you only have it in the dialects, you don't have it in the normalized standardized language. <coughs> So, where does this lead me to? That does lead me to a few conclusions. <clears throat> First of all, we have to say that Lara, typologically rare characteristics, can arise in any language, but they can spread more easily in small, tightly knit communities, and they are more likely to be retained in small or enclave communities as they are less likely to be subjected to normalization and assimilative pressure. And they only survive in larger languages when they are not exposed to assimilative pressure, that is, when they are in contact with related languages that share the same typologically rare properties. This explains, for example, why, why we have some typologically rare properties in big languages like Chinese, Cantonese, German, English, French, and so on. And that actually already leads me to the end, to questions and answers. So I'm a little too fast. I was five minutes too fast. I'm sorry. But that's where we are right now. Thank you for listening. OK. Um, thank you, Dr. Volgamut, for the interesting and fruitful presentation. Let me now open the question and answer session. Um, you can raise your hand or you can type your question in the chat room now. Um, we open for two questions first and then we, we can see how uh, it goes. Um, okay. Yep, so any questions, comments?
everybody exhausted. <laughs> Hello. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, May I ask something? Maria. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Please. Um, in Maria Olga. Um, yeah. Maria Olga Jalimut. Jalimut. Okay. Oh. Okay. Where are you from? Yeah. First of all, first of all, um, I really was just uh, appreciate for the materials because um, it's really interesting materials and also uh the way. Um, doctor presented it is really um, affected me, and then actually I have a not actually questions because I am really I really want to uh, analyze relates to the extra linguistics rarity. Um, what about when we are in a small uh, small community? And in a small community, and then we are communicating with uh, with them, and we are coming from the same cultures, and uh, we just find like a small rarity there. So my question is, uh, what can we analyze when we are um, in uh, was that interacting in a same community, a same community, and then same cultures? What what kind of um, uh, rarity that that is really interesting to be analyzed. Thank you. Well, from from inside the language, you usually don't see typological rarity. That is, you can only see it in the, in the comparison to other languages. That is, most speakers uh, of a language having some kind of rare characteristic are not aware of it unless it's really in your eyes. Like uh, in German, you have one letter called SZ, which is a Historically, it's a ligature of two letters, but we treat it as one letter, and it only occurs in standard German orthography. You don't have it in Swiss German either, uh, and you don't have it in any other language. So, of course, that is something that is in your eyes, because you, as soon as you see a German computer keyboard, you see that letter there that's not there otherwise. So that's when you are aware of it. But these are, these are rare cases. Yeah, if it's something about word order or if it's something about uh, grammatical marking, normally speakers of the language will not even be aware of it unless they do this conspiracy thing that Kulik uh, mentioned. And that is, they are not aware of it and they don't they don't talk about it. So it's not relevant for, for the speakers of the community. It's something that, for example, the assimilation and everything that happens, in context situation, that is, if a language is exposed to some majority language, to some colonial language, which is not the majority but has more more power, uh, then these languages are in a contrast, and that means that the speakers of these languages um, all, all of a sudden find themselves being exposed to a language that is structurally different, and then they can consciously or subconsciously uh, map these differences on their own language and see, well, one of them is different, but what they don't see whether it's typologically rare. That's, that's something that linguists see where they have a typological database of hundreds of languages, and then they can say, okay, this is rare, this is usual. I'm not sure whether that answered your question, actually. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, no follow-up question. We have a question in the chat room um, from uh, Arin Sirima. Yeah. Uh, you see that? Oh yeah. Um, which aspect of rarity uh, I compare? Actually, the World Atlas of Language Structure um, compares all of these. It has chapters on phon phonetics, phonology, that is phonetics like having certain sounds, certain types of sounds, or not having certain types of sounds, phonology, having big or small phoneme inventories, lacking nasals, or having a long, uh, having lots of, of, of labial sounds or so on. It has chapters on morphology, um, on whether language is prefixing, suffixing, whether it has affixes at all. Uh, it has chapters on syntax. Uh, 
yeah, that, that was my omission. And uh, this is a uh, yeah, really good point that you pointed this out. So in the World Atlas of Language Structures, we compare all different levels, even up to, to, uh, to the lexicon uh, and to, to, uh, to the writing systems. Uh, so we, we, have, we compare these on all different levels of, of, of description. Um, so yes, there, there are rara on the phonological level, there are some on the morphological level, uh, syntactical level, lexic. Well, we didn't do much on the lexical level because that would be a completely different thing. Um, but for all different layers of grammar, um, there are there can be rara on all of them. <clears throat> Like a, a morphological thing is, for example, um, that most languages do have a clusiv clusivity distinction, first person plural, yeah, the, the kami kita thing. Um, I'm so glad that I don't have to explain this. Normally my audience would be Europeans who don't have this distinction. So, but, but here with, with, with the Indonesian crowd, I just can say, yeah, you know, kami kita thing and you know what I mean. Uh, Languages of Europe don't have that, and that makes a negative warum. Yeah, that is in Europe, in most European languages, you don't have this distinction. It's common in Europe not to have it, but it's uncommon globally uh, not to have it. And that's a morphological, on the morphological level. So. And then the next question is from Reinhardt. Uh -huh. have a quick way of seeing a rarity of a language in a short field work. As an outsider, sometimes it's hard to detect this issue. Yeah, uh, there's no quick way unless you have a lot, uh, unless you have a typological database in your head. That is, um, of course, we have some expectations. We know what the standard average human language should look like. Yeah, if we have a language that um, would not, would not distinguish between three participants in a, in, a, in a conversation, speaker, listener, and outsider. Yeah, so first, second, and third person. If we find a language not having this distinction, that would already give you a good warning. Oh, there's something going on here. Um, but uh, other than that, we can only see that rarity as compared to other languages. So. Um, Um, so it's not there's no quick way unless you can compare it to can, can compare the language to others online as if uh, you, you're documenting a language and you see oh they're doing this and this and this and this says tells you something oh this is unexpected this is actually uh, how this Rara discussion uh, uh, kind of escalated into linguistics wars between Dan Everett uh, and, and Peter Ladifoget and others on the one side and uh, Noam Chomsky on the other side, uh, because uh, mostly um, uh, Dan Everett found in the language called Piraha in, in the um, Brazilian rainforest, um, a language that lacked many features that you would expect. They don't have num numerals, they don't have number, they don't, have dis they don't even have number distinction and pronouns. They don't have recursion. They don't have any kind of tense or uh, any kind of tense aspect system. Um, and uh, so basically, there's a lot of negative uh, there, saying, oh, this language does not have this. And uh, at some point, it strikes. Like, then from, from, I know it from Dan Everett because he talked about it at length at a lot of conference. Um, you, you go to this language and you try to tell as a field worker and, and you want to teach them or you want to you want them to teach you how to count in their languages and they didn't even know what to count is. Yeah, that's when, when you see, oh yeah, there's something going on here. That's when you see that there's a uh, um, that's that's that uh, but other than that you, there's no quick way. Especially with with uh, relative Raha, because if you're working in an area like say you, you're working on the languages of Kalimantan, yeah, you're working in one area and you see, oh yeah, this language has this feature, uh, probably the neighboring languages has, have it too. And, and it still may be rare on the global scale, but you don't see that on the local scale. So uh, as a field worker, you don't really have a way, a quick way to see it other than comparing it with, a, with the existing database. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, if you have a follow up question, you can uh, type or you can uh, raise your hand and heart. And then next, do we see anything else? Sorry. Yeah, there's one. There's one question in the chat. Um, I will make the slides available on, on ResearchGate, um, <clears throat> um, and maybe maybe we can we can distribute a link later on. Um, I want to add a correction with the. I want to add one or two corrections before that, but I, I can make the slides available. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we will send you the link once it's available on ResearchGate. Okay. So any other questions or comments? Um, for... now, Ahmad Fauzan. I have a question. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe we should, um, since I started this, Ahmad Fauzan's mm -hmm. question, and then after that, uh, um, how much, uh, so how, how significant is it to identify the extra linguistic factors in the development of typological rarity? Well, you see, type, typologists, um, or this, this um, entire uh, work on linguistic rarity is, is uh, in some, to some extent, an act of rebellion. In the 1940s to 60s, people started looking for universals. It started in anthropology and then it spilled over to linguistics. And people were looking for universals because they wanted to know, oh yeah, if we find things that are universal to all human language, we learn something about the human mind. Yeah, we learn how, how human mind, how human brains do language. And uh, actually a few colleagues and I started this rebellion and said, and said no, Actually, we learn much more about human cognition if we look at the other end, not what all languages do, but we, we look at what only some languages do, because that is the variation. That is what, where, where we actually extend the frame of possible human language. I guess you remember these squares in, in the beginning. Yeah, the, the line of the, of the squares is possible human language. So if we find something that is uh, rare, unexpected, uh, that extends our knowledge of what to expect in, in possible human or possible languages at all. And as soon as we see these things, we want to know how come, why do we have a universal? And in, in the 1960s, people believed that, oh yeah, there are universals like every language has a three person, two number distinction, at least in pronouns, uh, until we found languages not having this distinction. And so we need to explain how come they, they don't have this distinction. Uh, distinction. Um, there is, for example, a there has been a universal saying that all languages have bilabial sounds uh, until they found some languages that don't have bilabial sounds. And the only explanation for those is that there are people who like to pierce their lower lips. And once you do that, you have no bilabial sounds anymore. You have no bilabial sounds anymore. Yeah, so the languages lost their bilabial sounds due to extra linguistic factors. So we only can explain the, 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 this negative problem having more bilabials by extra linguistic factors. And so that's why it's interesting. And actually, it's, it's uh, interesting not only for typology, but also in general for, for knowing about social linguistics, knowing about language change, that we take into account extra linguistic factors. And this is rather new. That is, 20 years ago, people did not so much talk about it, or when they did, they did just talk about it in one paragraph and that's it. Um, <clears throat> and now we see that we cannot explain language change or uh, language evolution only by looking at language without looking at the, at the factors around, like community, setting, geography, and all these things. So that's why it's important or significant that we have um, that we have a look at extra linguistic factors. Um, actually, um, we, had, we had this RARA conference in, in 2006, and in the same year, we had a conference on languages of hunter-gatherer communities. And the conference papers from that conference were finally published a few weeks ago uh, by Güldemann and others, uh, languages of hunter-gatherers. And there, are, there too, they use a lot of extra linguistic factors to explain 
the linguistic makeup of these languages. Same, there's a book by, by Trudgell that has been uh, published in March or April this year on social linguistic typology and on, on, the, on, uh, on millennia of language change. And he also makes a strong point that many factors of language change, many factors of that, that uh, are responsible for why is the language the way it is now are extra linguistic factors. So if we don't look at the, at the extra linguistic factors, we cannot give good explanations. Yeah, this is in stark contrast to, to uh, 19th century linguistics, historic linguistics, where people only looked at language change, language internally. That is, oh, we have our sharp sound changes and we have our sound laws and we have erosion and, and all these things and degrammaticalization, grammaticalization, and all these things that go on in the language, okay? But as soon as you want to know why, uh, you have to look at extra linguistic factors too. <clears throat> um, okay, so I heard earlier Tessa was about to ask a question. Uh, are you still on that? Thank Tessa? you. Okay, please. Yes. But I won't be able to turn on the video because um, the internet is really weak. Um, yeah, I wonder what will you say about uh, Indonesian context with um, using this uh, theory of development type of, type of linguistic to, uh, rarity? What do you think the condition of Indonesian languages in the future? Well, um... Basically, the situation for, for most of the, re, let's call them regional uh, Indonesian languages, is the same like it is in, in most parts of the world where you, where you have a lot of regional languages which are exposed to pressure from a national language or from national languages, uh, plus globalization pressure from English. Yeah? So like Bahasa Indonesia, for example, is kind of sandwiched in the pressure. Yeah? It gets pressure from English, yeah? globalization pressure from yeah? assimilative pressure from English, but it also Bahasa Indonesia exerts pressure on the local languages. Uh, and so people are exposed to this. And of course, whenever people are exposed to a majority language, there is a chance that they will subconsciously change their linguistic profile and they will assimilate things. Um, one example from, 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 from a paper uh, in the, on the endangered uh, is um, naming systems. If, if a country says uh, people have to have a certain kind of name, yeah, and some, some names are valid and some names are invalid and some, some guy, some person in some office somewhere decides whether parents can name their child this or not, um, then you have direct influence on the system uh, of these languages. And one example is that, um, I don't remember the name of the language right now, but it's a language from Kalimantan, where naming is called, uh, is a, a technonymic pattern that is, some, uh, you know all these things like where you where you name people like their parents after their parents and uh, people get their name from their parents, but there are cultures uh, where people get their name after their first child. So when you become a parent, you are given a new name like father of or mother of, and so you will have to change your name. And most authorities, be it in Indonesia, be it in the Philippines, be it in South Africa, don't allow for that officially. So you're not allowed to do that. So you keep your name. And there you have conflict. There you have something where the, where the social linguistic or extra linguistic setting does not allow for something from within the language to, to, uh, to be there. Um, <clears throat> Other than that, uh, it very much depends on how much the regional languages are exposed to other languages. If we have enclave situations where people in their daily lives are not exposed to Basa and to English, then their languages will probably change in a different way and in a different pace uh, than from, from being exposed to majority languages. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you. Is that clear? We have a follow up question, Tyson, or comment? No? Okay, now there's another question. In other words, extra linguistic factor is significant to analyze the issues in phonology, such as the change in bilabial, so that it can explain why people have different accents and dialects, especially using typological approaches that so. Quick answer, yes. So you ex with, with this, we can at least have one model, not the model, not the only model, but one explanation why languages, some languages are the way they are. And for some languages, we have to look at extra linguistic factors to explain their typological uh, makeup, whether it's phonological, morphological, onomastic. Uh, that's uh, um, that's that's uh, secondary here. But yes, uh, we can use extra these extra linguistic factors to explain some of the features or characteristics of languages. Yes. And the next question is from Arna Beatrice Nunes. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question. Do you think assimilative pressure would affect all layers of grammar equally? For example, wouldn't it be more likely for a rare phenomenon, phoneme of a minority language to be stigmatized than a rare constitu constituent order or other less salient features? Oh, um, about the rare constituent orders, um, there's so many memes going on, um, people making fun of the way, like, for example, Yoda in, in Star Wars talks, your father, he is, yeah, OSV. Uh, that is a very marked uh, basic order, and it will be, it's visible, immediately visible. Uh, it's very salient. Um, and of course, this could be stigmatized. Um, yeah, and people using the wrong word order will probably be called out or be stigmatized at some point. Um, so yes, um, <clears throat> uh, there, this estimated pressure is of course more visible in salient features, but then there, again, there's, there's, uh, there's another extra linguistic factor and that is speaker attitude. If the speaker community is very strong-minded, and they say, no, we don't want that. They will maintain things, even under pressure. Yeah, um, and if they, on the other hand, either they are not so strong-minded or the pressure is so strong uh, that they will give in, then some features will disappear more quickly. Um, I'm, I'm coming from the field of loan word research, and uh, there we could see that uh, the speaker attitude makes a lot of difference. That is, some, sp some speech communities just decide, we don't do wrong words. They just don't do it. They don't borrow words. Yeah? And that, of course, has an impact on the language. So they have to create words for, for cultural artifacts that are brought to them and then things they didn't see before. But they don't borrow words. And other languages borrow, are very happy to borrow. Yeah? German or, or Basque and Indonesia are very happy to take English words and, and uh, make, make wonderful things with these borrowed words. Um, yeah, so speaker attitude is, a, is, a, is another factor which I cannot talk about now. That would be a different talk. Um, so <clears throat> the, the stigmatization and all this uh, can affect all layers, whether you see it or not. I'm not sure whether that really satisfied your question. <laughs> uh, would it be more likely? Um, I, I don't want to go so far as to say what would be more likely uh, because I don't have the data for that. Uh, probably uh, Trudgell has some data for that. So if you're interested in that, you should look at uh, Trudgell's most recent book. The, the, um, it's in re the references section of the slides, which you can download later. Um, so yeah, that would be that would be something that probably other people um, um, know more about whether it's more likely. Um, I only looked at the fact whether it's uh, more likely to to develop in a language, not whether it's more likely to disappear or be stigmatized. But yes, in general, everything like that can can happen. Okay, the next question is from Josefina. 
The development of technology makes people all around the world learn English every day to be able to deal with it. Mm -hmm. They tend or prefer to acquire and use English in everyday, everyday life rather than using their own language. Realizing to this fact, do you think about, what do you think about the existence of other languages in the world? What is your suggestion for the speakers of the languages in the world to maintain their language? Oh, oh, that would be a lovely topic for another completely talk. For another uh, talk. <laughs> um, in brief, um, I think it's about time that um, we get, uh, and we will pro most probably um, get away from the uh, absolute hegemony of English. If you compare it uh, in the beginning of the 1990s, almost 100%, well, in the beginning, of course, 100% of the internet was English because it started in the United States between two of three universities only, and that was all English. In the mid 1990s, and ever since, the, the percentage of English ever decreased. So right now you find a lot of things in the internet in other languages, yeah? And in, in the end 1990s, people said, yeah, but you cannot do this online because you don't have yeah, like for example, you cannot do Japanese or Russian or Bukis or whatever on the internet because you don't have the writing system. You, you only can use Latin. And so what did people do? They didn't give in, especially, especially um, in, in China and Japan, people did not give in. They developed technology to write on the internet in their language, in their writing system. And if you look, for example, uh, a very interesting development, uh, if you look uh, at the Google homepage or Facebook homepage, and you can switch the user interface to a lot of different languages. And the number of languages available is getting ever bigger and bigger and bigger. So I think in the medium run, we will find more medium-sized languages on the internet, not the very small ones, because many of these communities are not even exposed to the internet. They use other media and they use uh, oral communication, but on, on, the, uh, on the internet, you can see that the linguistic diversity is actually increasing. That is, we find more and more different languages, yeah? When, when Google Translate started, they had English and four, five, six other languages, yeah? Just look at Google Translate now, they have Sundanese in there, they have Javanese in there, and I don't know how many other Indonesian languages, yeah? I, I should have counted it, but they, you, you see that the, that the development is going that way. That doesn't mean that the pressure is getting less. It's just that, that uh, co language communities are working against this pressure. They're not accepting it anymore as, as, as if it was a natural given that English is the dominant language of the world. Uh, so people are working against it. So I hope that some speech communities really have the uh, the, the grids and, and say, no, we want our language on the internet. We don't want to learn English to access the internet. We want the inter internet to learn our language. Um, and if, if a lot of speaker communities have this attitude, then we will see that on the, on the internet. Okay. Now, do you have any more question? I, oh, no more? Does anyone still want to raise questions or maybe give comments or uh, something for discussion? Or any follow-up questions? No? One, two, three, done, no? Okay. Ah, wait, there's one. <laughs> oh, there's one. Maintaining yeah. and preserving our own local language is a challenge for us. Yes, indeed it is. Yeah. Yes, indeed it is. And actually, there's a lot of things going underway. So, um, like, for example, there is a lot being done on the documentation of the Bahasa Daira and, and all the small communities. And um, I hope that most of these languages do survive. Um, there is this trend, and people say that by the end of this century, 50% or more of the human languages of linguistic diversity will be gone. Um, I hope that we can put something against it. And that is that, uh, especially as, as speakers of the big languages, like German, English, Basel, and Messia, we need to encourage people uh, to maintain their own language yeah, 
and, and we have to give them opportunity to use these languages. Yeah. Um, and then, and only then, uh, they can be, they can have a chance to maintain that language. <clears throat> Uh, okay. One comment, can I? Yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead. So, can I can I conclude or at least, yeah, make assumption that basically uh, typological rarity uh, happens also because the, it happens by the decision made by the community. I mean, subconsciously throughout the time, um, they oh. decide they decide to okay, let's not make not. Not necessarily make uh, uh, sub, uh, not necessarily make um, conscious decision, but throughout the time they slowly drop this uh, linguistic feature, but add something else and something like this. Do you think um, that's the case? Definitely. I mean, all language change goes on like this. Speakers decide consciously or subconsciously what they want. That is actually. Um, there is a contact, uh, um, a kind of conceptualization metaphor, if you wish, uh, that basically communication is like uh, like uh, evolution, and so every every act of communication is a chance for natural selection. That is, every time I choose a form, an utterance, a grammatical feature, whether I use it or not, I make a decision whether this form is fit whether this form is adapted for my purposes. And if I use it, kind of I propagate its genes to the next generation, yeah? And if you reuse the form too, then you propagate it to the next generation after that. So if, if you look at it like this, then yes, language change always is a conscious to subconscious decision whether you want to use certain things or not. Um, um, yeah. One, one example from, from Indonesian would be um, during the past 20, 30 years, um, you could notice that people use the numeral quantifiers less and less and less. So uh, things like seorang, sebua, seekor, sehele, sekucuk, whatever, yeah, all these things, it's getting less and less. It's, it's a subconscious decision for most people and in some cases, it's a conscious decision. So it's difficult to say whether it's only one thing or the other thing, but it's, this is something that's going on and it, sums, it adds up. So people see other people doing this or not doing this and they copy it or not copy it. And that's a decision that is on the, on the brink between conscious and subconscious. And that's how language change always propagates in a community. And of course it propagates more quickly and more thoroughly in a small community because if you have like one or two influential people there and they do something, everybody copies it, that's much easier in a community of 200 or 100 people than in a community of 20 million. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yep, so it's already 10.30 and we don't see any more questions anyway. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Volgamut. I would also like to thank all the participants for attending our event. Please kindly fill out the questionnaire. Uh, we have shared the link in the chat box. Um, that's a evaluation form so that we can evaluate our, our event and then provide better service in the future. So before we end this uh, session, let us have a photo session. If, um, so please turn on your camera your video, um, and then Sancho from our IT department will take our picture. Sancho. And I, I, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to do some linguistics and to, My yeah, to do something to do something I haven't done in a long time, and uh, be nostalgic about one of my favorite topics and present it to an interested audience. So thank you for, for making it possible. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah, so everyone, please um, turn on your video so that uh, we can start taking pictures. We can, we probably need to take a few times because there are about, no, 100 something, 107. So, Sancho, siap.
Cok. Wait. Let me check. Sancho. Iya, Bu. Iya, Bu Yanti. Ya, to tolong kita foto ya. Oke, okay, baik, Ibu. Ya. Perlengkapan? Iya, tadi. Si Sebentar, Bu. Uh, ya, yeah, I'm sorry. He's in the office. Ya, dalam hitungan aku ya, Bu. Ma. Ya, nggak apa-apa. Sebentar, Bu. Oke. Okay. Uh, layar pertama. Satu, dua, tiga. Oke, okay, uh, untuk layar kedua Masih ada beberapa yang belum menyalakan, nggak apa-apa uh, Ayo Ibu Bapak, tapi kalau sinyal internetnya susah, tidak apa-apa Masih ada Bu Mersia, atau Bu Pajermi Ada Bu Leika, Bu Bernadette, Bu Regina Jadi, Ya, kita oke okay. Langsung saja uh, Langsung jauh. saja ya, baik ya. Kalau gitu. uh, Layar kedua, satu, dua, tiga Baik. Layar ketiga baik Satu, dua, tiga Oke, layar keempat Satu, dua, tiga Layar kelima Satu, dua, tiga Baik, kalau kita sudah Ibu Sudah foto semua Oke, baik, terima kasih Sancho Okay, thank you again, everyone. Hope to see you in the future, in our in our future events. Have a good day.